Is that a chart in that frame behind you? Is that a big chart? I guess the history I have of the more doll. Of them. You only see the two back here, but yeah. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Yeah. <laughs> another it, chart, another chart geek. I love it. So when I was at Fidelity, we had the chart room and I used to love sitting in there just having these big charts all around us. And so when I set up the home office, I was like, I need to get some sort of charts and hang them all around me. So yeah, I'm kind of yeah. surrounded by, by visuals here. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could find some wallpaper, like chart wallpaper, <laughs> you know, hundreds of charts. I'd get my ruler out in an ink pen. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs>
did that a couple of times. I just became enthralled by this world that I was seeing, knew nothing about it. But uh, it, for me, it was just extremely, extremely, uh, it was both puzzling and amazing at the same time and that these guys <laughs> would go in this pit and yell and scream and wave their hands and uh, and do well financially, work for themselves, not have a boss to report to, not have to go to meetings, not write memos, not write reports, uh, you know, start trading at, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, be done at one fifteen. Uh, that, that, that was a pretty cool gig, I thought. And, uh, you know, so it was appealing to me and it, it's the decision I made. And, you know, there, I think back then, probably still to some degree, trading, everybody starts at the bottom. You know, you don't, you're not on an MBA pot fast track. You, you start as a grunt and, you, you know, and, and then it, it's kind of the, the, the life of the fittest, right? It's the, uh survival of the fittest and many wash out but you just you know i took a position a menial menial position really almost a clerical position with a large grain grain company it's where i could get in you get in on the bottom floor and just find somebody that will hire you to do something and try to figure out where you go from there and that's the route i went and that was 1975 and so Great. I went and started working at uh, LaSalle and Jackson at the Chicago Board of Trade in 1975. I knew I wanted to be a trader, but I didn't really even know what that meant uh, <laughs> other than it's the guys that were buying and selling stuff all day. And yeah. uh, so I had to learn it. I had to learn it from, from the bottom up. So early on in your career, as you're sort of getting your feet under you, learning about this whole discipline, were there mentors that you that you learned from that helped you in the in the formative years, or were you more self-taught learning as you go? Well, I, I mean, I think it's a combination of both, right? I, I mean, you, you have to figure out what your place is in the world uh, of trading, so to speak. But you know, I, I picture these kids today that start out trading in their basement on a, on, on a computer, and they don't have a world around them of other traders. There's nowhere to bounce ideas where. Uh, I just think it would be very tough to start out without being in an exchange setting. You ride on elevators with traders. You become friends of traders. You go have lunch with traders. Uh, you, you're with traders all day long. And, you know, in the process, you find traders who are willing to give to you and share with you. And, and there were a few uh, early on in the early years that really took an interest in me and were willing to, to really uh, try to help me along the way because you all make mistakes. And sometimes a mentor is just somebody that'll kind of give you a warning of what a mistake's going to look like when you get there. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to be knee deep in, the, in, in a mistake before you realize you're in the mistake. <laughs> you know, you just get your toe wet because they've given you kind of warning, look out for this or look out for that. So, yeah, I, I had, there was one uh, one gentleman in particular who was a, he was a corn trader for Cargill that, that really shared so much with me, became a good friend and uh, really took me under his wing in those early years to try to figure out the, my way in the world of trading. Now, where along the way were you introduced to the discipline of technical analysis? Did that just come time in the pits, seeing how others were doing it? Or how were you introduced to charting as part of your investment process? Well, through mistakes or blowing out accounts. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I wasn't sure. I first I had to learn kind of the mechanics of the market. What's, the mecha what's a contract? How does it work? Yeah. Uh, what is pro what's pricing mechanism? What does that look like? And uh, you know, I kind of knew I, I, I wanted to be a trader. And so, you know, I'd raise a little money and I'd start trading. And I tried it. I tried a number of ways in the early years, 75, 76, 77 into 78. I think I probably blew out three or four accounts. <laughs> you know, I tried trading fundamentally. I tried spreads. I tried point and figure charting and, uh, you know, I, I, I really tried a whole bunch of things. That's when uh, another friend of mine brought me over to the bookstore uh, in the Board of Trade and bought me a copy of the Edwards and McGee book, fifth edition, 1948, uh, Technical Analysis and Stock Market Trends. And that just resonated with me. I, I mean, I had tried four or five different ways of trading without success. 
And uh, I just gobbled up Edwards McGee and then Schaubacher, of course, because sure. Edwards McGee referred to Schaubacher as the origin, yeah. uh, the, the, the original manuscript on codifying classical charting. And so I gobbled up everything by Schaubacher I could read and uh, just started looking at the markets through the lens of classical charts, of daily, daily charts, weekly charts. You know, we keep our charts by hand back then. We didn't have computers that would crank out charts and generate indicators that we could modify. Uh, I mean, we, we got graph paper and we started charting. That's how we did it. And, uh, but it made sense to me. And, you know, all of a sudden I wasn't blowing out an account, but actually starting to build the foundation for trading. And that was probably 78, 79. I, I really started becoming better at trading, accomplished at trading. I was lucky enough to have some, some really sizable moves during that period of time and, you know, 80. And then in October of 1981, I, I uh, uh, gave up all the customer business that I've been attached to and went off on my own and founded Factor Trading at the Board of Trade and uh, Factor Trading continues to this day. So, you know, with your start in the mid to late seventies going through, I mean, some incredible boom and bust periods along the way here. Um, you know, right now here as we're recording this in early 2021, we're arguably, you know, in, in this extended, euphoria of a, of a market uptrend. What have you learned from previous uh, scenarios, previous times that are similar to this that you could help people make sense of what's going on here? Wow, you know, I was thinking about that the other day, you know, from 1975 through 1982, 1983, the, the, the range from high to low in the Dow Jones was 500 points. You know, we trade 500 point ranges in the day today, uh, I mean, we, we trade in the day what we didn't trade in the seven year period, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, I, I mean, that, that, that I've I traded the Dow in effect at, you know, 600, 700 on the Dow, yeah. you, you know, and, you know, I remember when the Dow first blew through 1150 for the first time and, you know, the, the bull market that we have today really began at that point. I mean, I, I just think all markets come and go. Markets are cycles. We get big bull markets and they will end. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we have good times. And, and so I think what uh, really what I've learned is, you know, you cannot become dogmatic about an idea. You, mm -hmm. you have to look at markets. You have to be flexible. You have to be willing to, to really recognize that no matter what you think a market should do, no matter how sure you are that a market's going to do what you think it's going to do, at the end of the day, you don't really have a clue. Uh, markets are going to do what markets are going to do with or without you. Uh, and in the process, yeah, yeah, they're going to humble you. They're going to expose every mistake you can make. Uh, you, you know, I, I'm convinced more and more as I grow older that one of the purposes of the market is to make us feel stupid. <laughs> and, 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 and they do that all the time, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the key thing for me is that this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And uh, it, it's a great place to earn a living. It's a great place to have a career. But in the process, you have to, I think a trader has to remember that there are good times and there are bad times. You know, trading the markets is not an annuity. You know, we're, we're not dealing with an annuity here. We're dealing with something where uh, you have great trades and then you have to live through a bunch of miserable trades, to find the great trades again. And, you know, everything that I've read by the old masters uh, really deals with risk management. You've got to keep your capital together. It goes back, to, you know, it's Jesse Livermore on. It's through Jack Swagger's Marco Wizard's books. Yeah. You, you, you read about these people who have become accomplished traders over the years, and there are certain themes that come out. I mean, one of those themes is you can't do it the same way somebody else did. You got to figure yeah. out your own way. And usually that's through making mistakes. I, I mean, you pay a tuition to learn. 
Uh, but then the other thing is you just, you got to, you can't take big losses. I've just seen it, uh, you know, at the Board of Trade hundreds of times, hundreds of people coming and going through the revolving door. Mm. Uh, you know, and since uh, been being part of this whole thing called market speculation, you know, I've been exposed to dozens and dozens of people who have wanted to trade, but it was a big loss or two that kept them from really having that that ability to. And I, I think one other thing, Dave, is it takes it takes three, four years to really get your footing under you as a trader, I think, to get a sense of what you want to do. And then it takes the rest of your life to kind of uh, not perfect it, but really become skilled, become a craftsman at, at, at what you're trying to do. It's a lifelong process, right? What, yeah, it sure your, is. Your, your, one of your books, Diary of a Professional Commodity Trader, Lessons from 21 Weeks of Real Trading, it was fascinating. It was, just, it was a really... It was a really fantastic look into you know your experiences over a stretch of time. And one of the quotes I love for you to comment on, you mentioned you know to your point earlier, drawdowns are a way of life for a trader. Periods of capital drawdown bring about tremendous introspection. When trading is going well, it's easy to think trading will never get bad again. When trading goes sour, it's difficult to remember the profitable times. Can you talk about? I mean, obviously going through the experiences that you had, how have you stayed centered? How have you dealt with the uncertainty of what we're all trying to do? You know, trading the markets. Well, you know, I've I've done it long enough, and I've done it long enough the same sort of way. Not not that we don't change or make some modifications how we do certain parts of of, of what we do of 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 what our skill set is. We're constantly trying to improve. We're constantly making small changes. But I've been through these cycles uh, uh, enough times that I know that I place my trust in a process, hmm. not my ability necessarily to be right on the next trade, uh, because I, I don't go a year without being wrong five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times in a row. You, you, you know, I mean, a year doesn't go by when, when, I, when I feel like I can't even buy a winning trade. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've been through these drawdowns enough to know that if I can keep my capital together, the markets have a way of normalizing. I don't care what the approach is that somebody takes to trade in, whether it's fundamentals, whether it's value investing, whether it's Elliott Wave, what, no matter what the approach is, there are times when what a trader does is in sync with the markets, and there are times when it's not in sync with the markets. That's mm -hmm. reality. And you have to live through kind of the tough times to get to the good times. And you have to keep your losses. You know, there, there was a, a, a 19th century philosopher and uh, uh, economist that I quote an awful lot, Viltredo uh, Pareto. It's the Pareto principle. Sure. The Pareto principle rules the, the, the world of market speculation. That you know, whatever your figure is, eighty percent of your your trades are garbage. Twenty percent produce eighty percent of your profits. Right. For me, it's fifteen eighty five, and mm. so it it doesn't matter. It is true almost every year. I can go back throughout my entire trading career to nineteen eighty one, and the reality is that fifteen percent of my trades produce eighty five percent of my profits. Now, some years it's 5% of my trades produce 100%. Some years it's 25 produce, 75, but it's Pareto principle territory. Yeah. And I, I don't care any young trader who's just starting out or a struggling trader that's listening to this, David, is, is going to be affected by the Pareto principle. Pro, Vilveda, Vilfredo Pareto rules the world. And so, you know, as long as you assume that that is true, which it is true, you come to realize that you, got, you have to live through 85 trades to find the 15 that really put in your bottom line. Right, right. You know, you mentioned just quickly going back through, you know, all of your trades going back and it struck, struck me as you were saying that, that the book that I mentioned, Diary of a Professional Commodity Trader, really is a masterclass on how to keep an effective trading journal or keep a track of your experiences as a trader. Can you talk about journaling and keeping a trading journal, how that fits in your process, why that's important to you? Well, I mean, it, it comes back to really, 
uh, as simple as if somebody asked me, uh, how do how do I make money that's traded maybe unsuccessfully for a couple of years? You know, it, the comment is, well, look at the trades you did that were good trades and try to figure out what those were all about. What did you do differently? Yeah. Or, you know, what is, what is it that works for you? Because it, it's not so much the, the what journaling does more than anything I think is it teaches a trader about himself and about ways that as a human being, you attempt to sabotage yourself at every turn. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that is the, the reality. A trader's worst enemy or biggest enemy is not the markets, it's not other traders. It's, it, it's, his, it's a trader's ability to not do what they think that they need to do to be successful. <laughs> And uh, I, I think just being conscious, being conscious of the things you do, being aware of the things you do, not just hitting buy and sell buttons all day long without thinking about the motive behind it, uh, about what was going on, about how you studied the market, about how you took decisions. Uh, I think self-awareness, journaling, and I don't journal as much as uh, I did at one point in my career, but on a different level, I'm still self-conscious. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm conscious about what it is that I'm that I'm doing. What's my process? What am I screwing up? What am I getting right? Peter, you've obviously had a, a very successful career, and congratulations on what you've done thus far. Can you talk or, or answer what what mistake along the way in your career have you has taught you the most? Uh, I think the mistake that, that, that's really that's really taught me m the most is uh, is having unrealistic expectations, thinking that I'm going to hit the uh, I'm going to hit the ball out of the park on every trade. You know, every day is going to be a winner. Every week is going to be a winner uh, because that mindset really attacks the principles of patience and discipline is it's patience it's it, it's knowing if if i were if a trader asked me what real thing do i really need to work and i'd say know what your trade is know what pitch you're you're, you're you want to swing on are, are you a uh, a professional baseball player that hits uh, th that does best when you get a fastball low and away uh for those who listen to you that are familiar with baseball do you yep. like do you like inside curveballs? Are those the ones you can punch out of the park? Right. Is, is know what it is. Are are you a trend trader? Do you do best with trends? Do you do best with mean re, 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 reversion? Do you do best uh, with day trading? Do you do best on weekly charts? It's trying to find really where your comfort zone is and knowing what it is. And when you know what that is, then you can know, you know, I think you have a better recollection of when you do a trade that you probably shouldn't have done. It's just, you have a, you have a frame of reference. I love that. You, you hit on the idea of self-awareness and being just aware of who you are as an investor, as a trader and trying to, trying to do, be that person, not try to be someone else. Peter, this has been fascinating. I wish we could speak for so much longer. This has been a pleasure. Where can people find you uh, online, uh, social media? Where can we point people for you? Well, I'm active on Twitter, you know, at Peter L. Brandt. Uh, they, they can probably, you know, if they get there, they can find other places where I'm at. When I do interviews such as this, David, I'll I'll put a, a link and, you know, I'm sure they can find other places where I've where I've had the privilege to talk to people uh, or, or uh, books I've been in. I was uh, in this last uh, Market Wizards book by Jack Schwager. And I recommend Market Wizards, all of the entire Market Wizards series is, is such a good book for people to read. Uh, I mean, that, that's probably my number one recommendation. Just read all the Market Wizards books and it'll be so helpful. Uh, but yeah, they can find me on Twitter. I'm usually saying something stupid. Every once in a while, I'll say <laughs> something that's smart. <laughs> There's a great wealth of information and insights in your uh, in your comments. 
And uh, I appreciate you mentioning the last uh, Market Wizards uh, book. I well, well deserve for you to be included. I, I encourage people. Hopefully, this gives them a taste of the sort of insights they could get from you uh, there. Yeah. Well, Peter, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Be well. Stay safe, and we'll talk. Yep. To you. All right. We'll we'll see you. Bye bye. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.